the year 102,023, a giant meteorite the size of Pluto is approaching the solar system. It's flying straight at Earth. But as the meteorite crosses Saturn's orbit, a swarm of minor probes approaches it. The scan revealed no minerals on the object, so the probes returned with nothing. Meanwhile, the Space Security Center and Alaska military personnel are setting up a laser. The solar system witnesses a sudden flare, and nothing remains of the dwarf-sized meteorite. Now, unless hydrogen miners on Jupiter post videos of another annihilation on social media, this is what the world will look like when humanity finally becomes a Type II civilization on the Kurdishev scale. We'll have almost infinite energy reserves, the ability to prepare for interstellar flights or to instantly destroy any threat. But will humanity really be safe? And what could destroy a Type II civilization? To reach the second type on the Kardashev scale, humanity must learn to extract energy not only from sources on Earth, but also directly from the Sun. And we're not talking about ordinary solar panels, but a whole megastructure around the star, a Dyson Sphere. This design was first proposed by Princeton University professor Freeman Dyson back in 1960. In modern terms, a Dyson Sphere is literally a colossal shell around a star and its closest planets. Such a sphere will collect all the star's energy and convert it into electricity, giving off some of the heat in the form of infrared radiation. The radius of this megastructure reaches one astronomical unit, that is, the distance from Earth to the Sun, and the thickness of the material is about three meters. What could go wrong with such a massive structure? Truth be told, almost everything. And the first obvious problem we'll face if we try to build a Dyson Sphere is resources. The fact is, we'll need somewhere around 1.5 to 10 to the 24th power of tons of material. For comparison, this is the mass of the largest planet in the solar system, Jupiter. So, in order to build a Dyson Sphere, humanity will have to process all the asteroids it can reach, and then we'll have to disassemble several rocky planets for materials. But it doesn't end only with some fantastic amount of resources. The thing is, the structure itself must be a perfect sphere, otherwise the Sun's gravity will crumple it into a foil ball. The materials for the sphere must also be extremely strong. After all, even the most advanced carbine, which is considered more reliable than graphene, is unsuitable for this purpose. But even if we manage to build this mega structure, it'll still be very unstable. The fact is that the star inside the Dyson Sphere must be perfectly centered. And if, for example, a meteorite crashes into the structure from the outside and slightly changes its location, the sphere will start drifting towards the sun and collapse. So does this mean it's impossible to build such a megastructure at all? Not really. In fact, humanity has just misunderstood Freeman Dyson. His sphere isn't a solid structure, but a set of small satellites that form a swarm around a star. They capture the sun's radiation and send the energy to Earth or another receiver via wireless transmission. Such a Dyson swarm already sounds more realistic. Of course, we'll need technologies that allow us to transmit energy wirelessly. Still, such a structure will require much less material than a solid sphere. Besides, the stability of the swarm will be much greater. But if you think the Dyson prefix goes solely with the sphere or the swarm, you're wrong. There's also the Dyson Bubble, a system of satellites with solar sails that don't rotate but seem to levitate around a star. Another option is a Dyson Shell, a kind of sphere where you can live on the inside. There's also the Pokrovsky Shell and the Niven Ring, which can also become an alternative to a Dyson Sphere. But no matter which option humanity chooses, we'll face problems in any case. 
Even to construct a single ring or a system of satellites, humanity will need much more resources than we have on Earth. So we'll have no choice but to look for materials elsewhere. And while destroying a few asteroids won't harm our system, the same cannot be said for planets. If we decide to disassemble Venus or Mars for materials, for example, we risk changing the orbit of our own planet. On top of that, if we build a full-fledged Dyson sphere, the light from the Sun won't reach the planets beyond Earth's orbit. In that case, we can definitely forget about colonizing Mars or exploring Pluto. Plus, the first solar flare could partially disable any megastructure around the Sun. But that's not even the most crucial thing here. Our star produces about 4 times 10 to the 26 power of joules of energy per second. Even if a Dyson Sphere swarm could intercept only about 10% of that volume, it's still considered a lot of energy. That is, in one second, this megastructure will collect 40 trillion times more power than humanity currently consumes in a day. And it needs to be transmitted and stored in some way. The most effective way would be to convert sunlight into antimatter. However, this poses new challenges for humanity, because we don't yet know how to store antimatter. Hypothetically, there are several ways. The first is to build traps of magnetic fields that will keep antimatter from coming into contact with matter. The second is to keep it in an ultra-cold environment. But neither of these storage facilities will be 100% reliable when it comes to large amounts of unstable antimatter. And if we make a mistake, we risk an explosion much, much worse than a nuclear one. After all, when antimatter and matter come into contact, they get annihilated and release a tremendous amount of energy. It seems that anything can go wrong with Dyson Sphere, literally at every step of the way, from the design stage to the production and subsequent energy storage. But let's imagine that when humanity becomes a Type II civilization, we'll understand physics much better and manage to build an infinite power. Power source. Will our problems end there? I wish so. Where will this Type II civilization spend so much energy? For example, the development of all planets, satellites, and other objects in the solar system. Humanity will be able to mine minerals in the Kuiper Belt, collect hydrogen on Jupiter, or grow avocados on Phobos. Even more, with advanced hydroponics technologies, we could turn Mars and its moons into a huge automated farm. New materials like graphene and aerogel will become so widespread that they'll replace plastic. With their help, humanity will be able to create advanced spacesuits with better protection from radiation, extreme temperatures, and solar wind. In addition, these materials might be used in medicine. Humanity will forever forget about fractures and bone problems because we'll be able to strengthen the skeleton with that. On top of that, genetic modification will become very common. You'll be able to change your skin color to green or grow a pair of tentacles in any beauty salon. But the most interesting thing is that this Type II civilization will most likely not have any computers, smartphones, and similar gadgets we're used to. They can be replaced by a tiny chip in new technologies such as brain-to-computer interfaces and computer-to-brain interfaces. They'll allow us to use the gadget literally with the power of thought, connect to the internet, type text, or just share fragments of our own memories on social media. At the same time, it'll let us instantly access any information and help us speed up our thought processes. And for conspiracy theorists who refuse to implant a chip in their brains, new technologies will be available in the form of glasses, like an improved version of Google Glass. But the most important changes will be in the security sector. When humanity becomes a Type II civilization, space threats such as giant asteroids will no longer bother us. On the contrary, any meteorite flying towards us from the Oort cloud or interstellar space will turn into a potential source of new resources. But if the object poses a direct threat to Earth, humanity already has an effective weapon in its arsenal that can destroy it in a matter of seconds. 
and I'm sure scientists won't resist the temptation to build such a device in the form of the Death Star. It'll be a spherical satellite orbiting Earth with a diameter of approximately 160 kilometers. There'll be a tank with antimatter inside it. And when Earth detects a dangerous asteroid approaching, the Death Star will shoot a beam of antimatter at it. To destroy a space object, it's enough to apply a force slightly greater than the gravity that holds the object together. For this to happen, the mass of the antimatter fired must be equal to about 200 millionths of percent of the meteorite's mass. For example, the asteroid Apophis, which has flown extremely close to Earth on several occasions, masses about 27 billion kilograms. Thus, it would take less than 5.5 kilograms of antimatter to destroy it. Just imagine, with the help of such a Death Star, it'll be possible to destroy any threat or each other. After all, Type II civilization will still have a certain division into countries, although it'll be significantly different from the modern one. And in any political system, there will always be an outsider who just can't sleep well until they destroy and reshape the world around. Imagine what might happen if someone like that gets their hands on a weapon capable of crushing space objects into dust. Yet, in fact, the greatest danger to humanity will come not even from the inside, but from the outside. It would seem that the Type II civilization will definitely protect itself, at least from external threats. After all, with those new weapons, we can instantly destroy any object that enters the solar system. But when representatives of another extraterrestrial civilization visit us, humanity will be doomed. If they arrive in the solar system, it would mean they've already reached the next level on the Kardashev scale, the third. This is when opportunities for interstellar travel open up. Such a civilization no longer extracts energy only from its own star, but from sources throughout the galaxy. And if it turns out to be aggressive, our Death Star will look like a child with a water gun against a heavily armed army. Therefore, one of the first tasks of the Type II civilization is not to give away the fact of its existence. And this is almost impossible to do. And all because of the Dyson Sphere. The thing is that any megastructure around the sun, whether it's a sphere, swarm, bubble, or ring, will emit part of the collected energy in the form of infrared radiation. And it's this radiation that will make us very visible to extraterrestrial civilizations. Our scientists are already investigating the sources of infrared radiation, trying to find traces of Type II civilizations in the universe. In 2015, Jason Wright at the University of Pennsylvania, within the framework of the GHAT project, examined 100,000 galaxies in the infrared range. And he found not a single trace of advanced civilizations. Does this mean there are no intelligent living beings in all these galaxies? Most likely, on the contrary, they exist, but for some reason, they are hiding from alien researchers. But in 2021, another scientist, Michael Garrett of the University of Manchester and Hong Ying Chen of the Chinese Academy of Sciences had better luck. They analyzed data from over 16,000 galaxies and found that four of them recorded more infrared radiation than expected. Two of these galaxies have natural sources that explain the mystery, but the other two do not. Garrett believes this radiation intensity could be attributed to the large amount of dust in these galaxies. But what if the dust is proof of the existence of an advanced civilization there? Brian Lackey, a researcher at the University of California, believes that advanced civilizations could still quietly extract the energy of a single star or even an entire galaxy. And a kind of alternative to Dyson Swarm, smart dust, helps them to do so. According to Lackey, it's a cluster of self-replicating nanobots that, like the megastructures we're used to, collect energy around stars, nebulae, and other sources. Such dust will work much more efficiently than the Dyson Sphere because it'll not be centralized and will be able to provide power to colonies in different parts of the galaxy. And this is especially useful when you discover interstellar travel and need recharge points in distant 
star systems. But even if humanity can develop smart dust at the stage of a Type II civilization, it'll hardly help us go unnoticed. And if a squadron of ships from a hostile civilization moves towards Earth, we'll have only one thing to do – run away. But although the Type II civilization has not yet mastered interstellar travel, luckily, humanity has several ways to disappear from the radar. However, we'll have to take the entire solar system with us. A Dyson Sphere is not the only megastructure we'll be able to build in the future. Another valuable invention for us will be the Stellar Engine. With its help, we'll make the Sun along with all the planets move along a given trajectory. But how can we move an entire star? Actually, there are several options. The first is the Shkodov Thruster, named after its developer, Soviet engineer Leonid Shkodov. Such a star engine is as simple as possible. It consists of a giant mirror orbiting the Sun, a kind of light sail. This megastructure should be static meaning it doesn't rotate around the star but rather hangs in one place. Thus, the Sun's radiation will become asymmetrical. It will be stronger on the side opposite the sail. This is how the thrust will arise, forcing our Sun to move towards the sail. At the same time, planets and other objects in our solar system will move along with the star. But will we be able to escape from our aggressive neighbors using the Shkodov thruster? If the sail itself reflects exactly half of the solar energy, it'll generate a thrust force equal to about 128 times 10 to the 16th power newtons. That's impressive. Still, it won't help us. The fact is that with this kind of thrust, the solar system will be able to reach a speed of 20 meters per second in about a million years. And during this period, we'll cover a distance of only three hundredths of a light year. Only in a billion years will our speed increase to 20 kilometers per second. And during this time, we'll have traveled approximately one-third of the Milky Way, 34,000 light years. It seems that at this rate, humanity will not escape anywhere. But fortunately, the Shkodov thruster is not our only option. Astronomer Matthew Kaplan from the University of Illinois proposed to use solar plasma to push the sun in a given direction. A Kaplan thruster is in fact a giant jet engine that should be located next to a star and use about a thousand kilograms of its plasma every second. The entire structure will constantly move towards the sun, emitting a plasma beam from the opposite side of the star and a jet of oxygen isotope from the other. In this way, the engine will literally push the sun in front of it, and this method is much more efficient than Shkodov's sail. After all, the Kaplan thruster will allow the sun to reach a speed of 200 kilometers per second in just 5 million years. Thus, in 1 million years, we'll be able to cover a distance of over 30 light years. This means we'll pass by the closest star to the solar system, Proxima Centauri, in 130,000 years. But we could move even faster. Alexander Sforonos of Yale University proposed to combine the thrusters of Shkodov and Kaplan into a single megastructure, the Sforonos Star Tug. As you can see, we're witnessing a real battle of engines named after scientists. I think only Dyson's tow truck could put an end to this. But for now, let's take a look at what kind of tugboat it is. Sforonos proposes to install a solar-powered engine instead of Shkodov's sail. Thus, it'll literally act as a tugboat and pull the star along. In theory, Sforonos' star tug will be able to accelerate the sun to 27% of the speed of light. This is a little over 80,000 kilometers per second. However, to reach this speed, the engine will have to use so much fuel that the sun will turn into a brown dwarf. As a result, humanity will still be able to escape from the ships of the Type III civilization, but at what cost? Either way, we still have one more option to escape from this terrible reality, literally. Do you remember I told you about smart dust that could replace a Dyson Sphere or Swarm? Each of these tiny dust particles containing nanoelectronics can connect with others to form a network. 
scientist Seth Shostak from the SETI Institute and royal astronomer Martin Rees believe that an advanced civilization could upload its consciousness to such a network. If humanity succeeded, we would exist simultaneously in all corners of the Milky Way, and our galaxy would literally come alive. What about you? Would you be willing to upload yourself into a tiny cosmic speck of dust? Share in the comments.